life for me. La 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 He was never ashamed of me when he came to give his love for me. I will sing before the love of my life. I will sing before the love of my life. I am not ashamed to sing. He was never ashamed of me when he came to pour his love for me. Oh, I'm cross of Calvary, he lavished his love on me. The pain I bring me will never be enough. Sacrifice to the Almighty Father, the God of our flesh, we honor your name this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of life. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us to the end of another day. Lord, we return the glory to you in the name of Jesus. As we open up our, your book, O oh God, to study your word, we ask that your Holy Spirit, the teacher, will be here. Lord, and that he will teach us all things in the name of Jesus. Let all that we do today, O oh God, bring him glory in the name of Jesus. Let everything we do, O oh God, glorify him. We we'll submit to his sovereignty this evening and we ask, O oh God, that his name be glorified forever. Thank you, O oh God of heaven. Father Lord, let your light illuminate everything that we do this evening so that Lord will be able to give you all the glory, all the honor and adoration. May your word be... Um, May your word this evening, O oh God, be, be relevant to our journey on every side, O oh God. Thank you, God of heaven. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen and amen. Good evening, everyone. Welcome and um, um, thank you for joining the class this evening and welcome. Please help me to share the link. If you've shared, I'm grateful. If you are yet to share the link, then please do so. We'll quickly go into Joshua chapter 9. Um, last week, um, the last class, which was last week Wednesday, because we didn't have any class on Saturday. Last week Wednesday, we looked at Joshua chapter 8. And in looking at Joshua ch chapter 8, we saw a number of things. One of the things we saw was that you cannot presume, because God's ways are not our ways, neither are his plans and our, pl our plans. The Bible says, as the earth is far from the heavens, or the heaven is far from the earth, so he has kept his plans far away from us. So we cannot assume or presume how God wants to deal with the issues that we will chance upon in our journey with him. Something else we learned last week is that details are used to test and prove our obedience to God. Details are used to test and prove our obedience to God. So when you get in a place with God and there are so many details, don't be frustrated, don't be distracted. Make sure you pay attention and be very careful to do exactly as you have been asked to do because t details are put in, um, set in place by God to test <coughs> our obedience. We also saw that patience is a virtue. That what that delay is not denier. That if only Achan had known that in the very next chapter, chapter eight, that the Lord will say to them that everything they find in in I they sh or A they should take, he would not have stolen from Jericho, and that stealing brought a lot of issues down, you know, into their lives. But the chief thing that I remember from last week is the fact that no matter what happens. No matter how, how, how low I fall, it doesn't matter that I'm flat on my face. 
as long as I will do the work of repentance, God will come and he will re restore me. Because that was what opened Joshua chapter 8. Today we move to Joshua chapter 9. It's a pretty long uh, chapter, not as long as last week, um, but not also as repetitive. And this chapter is one of my favorite chapters in the book of Joshua. It is so studded with lessons, life lessons that um, you need to pay attention this evening. So Joshua chapter 9 opens. Because if you remember Joshua chapter 8, they had not won the victory over Ai and um, everybody was fine, everybody was happy. But in Joshua chapter 9, the Bible opens, or uh, the scriptures open with, now when all the kings who were beyond the Jordan, in the hill country and in the low land, at the western edge of the hills of Judea, and all along the coast of the great Mediterranean Sea, toward Lebanon, the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites heard of this army and its victories over Jericho and Ai. They gathered together with one purpose, to fight with Joshua and with Israel. The fame of the children of Israel is now spreading. This fame is now spreading as per they heard what happened on the underside of the Jordan. Some of them knew people who lived in Jericho who were no more. If they didn't know anybody at all, these five kings or so knew the king of Jericho and now he was no more. They knew the king of Ai and now he was no more. Their entire cities had been leveled. So there is bound to be some fear and agitation in the lives of the people who were in Canaan land or in the promised land at that time. So the Bible says that the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites, six nations came together and they decided to form what you call a confederacy or an alliance. And what they wanted to do was to pull their resources together so that as one man they will march against the children of Israel. And if that truly happened, the tendency is that if God were not on their side, if it was just a battle fair and square, I don't think that the children of Israel would make it. But in verse number three, it says, When the, Gibe the people of Gibeon, these are the Hevites, one of the six city nations, if you like, that heard once they, uh, when they, they had, it looked like their kings ha had come together and they had made a pact that we will match up against Joshua and his men at Gilgad together. But the people of Gibeon, the, the ones also known as the Hevites, heard what God had done, what Joshua had done to Jericho and I. And they too acted craftily and cunningly and sent out, sent out, uh, set out and took along provisions, but, but took worn out sacks on their donkeys and wineskins, leather bottles that were worn out, and split open and patched together, and worn out patched sanders on their feet and worn out clothes, and all their supply of food was dry and had turned to crumbs. Verse number six, they went up to Joshua, <coughs> in the camp at Gilgal and said to him and the men of Israel, we have come from a far country, so now make a covenant treaty with us. But the men of Israel said to the Hevites, perhaps you are living within our land. How then can we make a covenant treaty with you? I want you to see something. As a matter of fact, I titled this chapter too much too soon. Too much too soon. Too much too soon. Too much too soon. One of the things I've learned in my line of work is the fact that I cannot be presumptuous. I cannot be presumptuous. It's not like I have learned that lesson a hundred percent. I still find myself, you know, falling in, you know, in the trap of not taking the time to ask God all the questions that I need to ask. And I set out, then I hit a, hit a roadblock or I find out that what I had made an investment in isn't what God has called me to. Um, I think the most recent of them, I've had that experience, especially a lot in hiring. The most recent of them is like a couple of months ago or about three months ago, 
where I had to hire someone. We had done the interview and everything. And logically on paper, she made sense. But I remember that leading to the time that she was resumed, I lost my peace. And so eventually I called the person who interviewed her for me and said to her, you know what, I don't think I, we should take this person. And she said, what is it? I said, I don't know what it is, but I don't think that this is what we should do. So she, she wasn't forthcoming to tell this person, oh, we can't hire any anymore. So I said, well, I would do it because I was pretty convinced that we shouldn't hire her. Long and short, I sent her a message saying, look, I'm sorry, but um, I don't think we're going to go on with the hire at this time. Um, if a time comes when we feel like we would need your services and you're still available, we would contact you and all of that. And I thought I had walked away from it, but the next day or so, she showed up at my office and a few other things happened and I made an emotional decision. I made an emotional decision and I hired her and she worked with me for exactly three weeks and those three weeks were pure hell for me. They were not pure hell because she was a bad person. As a matter of fact, she was doing a lot. She was trying a lot to fit into the role and to do what it was that I had asked that she had come to do. But I was in a terrible, terrible state. I couldn't sleep at night. I couldn't go to work. I mean, I, I, there, there was just so much that the Lord locked down in my spirit. And I knew by the end of the first week that I should just say no. But I mean, you have made a commitment to someone who truly needed to work and who is excited about working. How do you just walk into the office again and say, I'm sorry, I didn't do my whole homework properly, so I couldn't go on with it. So week one passed, week two, week three, eventually when it was really weighed me down. One day I summoned courage and I went to the office and I said to her, you know, I need to talk to you. So she came and I said, look, this is my situation. I do not know why, but since I hired you, I've lost peace. And I'm not saying you're a bad person. That's not what it is. I'm not even questioning your skills because I've not given you the opportunity to prove yourself. But this is not working. This is a nightmare for me. But I can't tell you why. And she took one look at me and she said to me, I know why. And that's part of another conversation that I cannot repeat here. But the long and short of the conversation is, I knew from the get-go that I shouldn't have gone this route. So when I was going that route, I wasn't making a spiritual decision. I wasn't obeying instructions, if you like. I was making an emotional decision. And the funny thing is that the emotional decision was a good one. It wasn't a bad one, but it wasn't God's will for me in that time of my life. So I'm grateful to God that she took it well because she also knew whatever the thing was that was causing the, the friction in the spirit. And then she took it in good faith and we parted. And even this morning I chatted with her. The point is that when you are walking with God, you don't just make decisions the way you want to make them. When the Lord puts his hand on you, you get to a point and you must pay attention to what heaven is saying. And in this nest that we're going into, if there was ever a time you would need to pay attention to what heaven is saying, this is that time. This is that time. From what we see in the book of Joshua, Joshua had six or so kings banded together and, and they wanted to come and take him and his people down. In the mix of that, some strangers show up and say to them, um, oh, we are from a very far country, so now make a covenant with us. I don't get it. My people say that when the handshake extends beyond the elbow, it becomes something else. So, I mean, there is nowhere under the sun that you just meet someone for the first time, not because they came on a recommendation. They didn't bring you a letter. They didn't bring you a parchment from one king. God didn't speak to them about you. And the next thing they say to you is make a covenant with us. I think that that should have sounded an alarm. But somehow, considering that Joshua is that man that God spoke to part time, 
Joshua was that man that God gave his instructions as they unfolded. How exactly did Joshua not understand that this, there was something really fishy about this conversation? How do you just meet me and within minutes or even if it was days of having a conversation with me, you land quickly in um, and make a covenant with me? It's like walking into, a, a, maybe somebody walk, walks off the street into my office and asks me to give them that ATM, let them go and withdraw money for me. As a matter of fact, this is even worse. Too much too soon. That should have sparked off something for Joshua and his men to say, ah, something is wrong here. But let's read on. So they said to Joshua, we have come from a far country, so now make a covenant with us. Verse 7, but the men of Israel said to the Hivites, perhaps you are living within our land. How then can we make a covenant treaty with you? This is what I call the nudge of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit was already telling them, mm -mm 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 -mm, don't do this. They had the answer right in front of them. They said, you are living in our land. How can we make a covenant treaty with you? This is not flesh and blood. They knew this was not suspicion. They somehow knew. But the Bible says they went quiet after saying it to them. They didn't pursue it. The men turned from them and turned to Joshua. It looks like Joshua was the target this time. They turned to Joshua and they said to Joshua, we are your servants. Then Joshua said to them, who are you and where do you come from? They said to him, your servants come from a far country, that a country that is very far away because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we have heard the news about him and all the remarkable things that he did in Israel. Be wary of praise singers. In this job that I do, especially on social media, I have learned that if there is anything I must be, it is careful. And, you know, the funny thing is, or the tricky part is, I have to be careful not to be brash and rash and rude to people. But I also have to be very careful not to swallow hook, line, and sinker, whatever anybody throws at me. And so you find that when, you know, you come at me from this job that I'm doing online, the tendency is I'm on the fence with you for a really long time. Because while I don't want to be rude to you, while I, wouldn't, I do not want to disrespect you, I also don't want us to have our lines of communications crossed at all. I want people to always remember that I am doing this because God asked me to do it. And where this is concerned, the glory of God takes pre pre preeminence. God and his word is priority. And so over time, I've had people send me a message, oh, this, that, 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 pray about this, and I'll ask a few questions, and then I'll say, I think you should go do this first, because we don't just pray. Just so that I do my best to maintain the integrity of the errand that God has sent me. Now, if I am that person, I, this small me, I try to do that, I think that Joshua, who was there with Moses, who got commissioned by himself, who has worked with God, Joshua, who just came out of a failure to listen on, on, on the, uh, in the case of I and the children of Israel. Joshua ought to be a lot more careful. But you see, the word will say to you, well, there's the, yes, it's the adage that says, uh, once beaten, twice shy. But I think that is because you have not understood the tricky ways of the devil or the enemy. And so this is not something you can just fob off. This is not something that you can just by willpower say, next time I will be very careful. That's not the way this works. What you would need to do is make sure that you have a, a failed proof, um, what, how would I call it, plan of how to go with God in your nest. So that you do not fall into deception, so that you do not get yourself into presumptions, so that you don't assume anything, so that you don't take everything at face surface or surface level. Because what's going to happen is this time is God, there is a mass, massive reset globally in the earth. You know that already. So that's no longer the news. 
And now in that reset, if you've been listening to this teaching, reverse orders, obsolete things coming to pass and all of that, there are a lot of prophecies going out and they are the word of God. Now that a prophecy went out does not mean that it is yours. So even when you come across something that looks like prophecy, it is your responsibility to take time out with God. Now, there are two ways to do it. And in fact, I, I recommend both ways. The first way is every single day you wake up, ask the Lord to lead you. Ask him to hold you by the hand. Request that the Holy Spirit takes you by the hand so that you don't get yourself into any kind of mess. That's number one. What the prayer is simple. Lord, align um, my heart with your will. Lord, align my heart with your will that I may not make mistakes. The psalmist says it like they say, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. So that's the first way, a daily um, surrender, a daily prayer. So Lord, I'm going off today. You need to help me. There's a song by Ben Zaube I like. It says something like this, the Yoruba song, obviously. It says, Ontao jela walo baba that was a man going out on his hustle and he knows to pray every single day that lord as i'm going out on this hustle what i'm looking for is my daily bread please do not make me pray for the enemy i'm asking that you pray because there is not even this season that you will fall prey to sheep um, in wolf in sheep clothing the Bible says it like this, the, the devil disguises himself as an angel of light. So you need to be, you know, up at par with the Holy Spirit on this one. The other one that I do, and this is my broad um, strategy before the daily one. This is my foundational strategy. Many years ago when the Lord called me to do this work, there was one thing I was sure of. It was that I wasn't wise enough. I wasn't smart enough. I didn't know the Bible enough. I didn't have any big brother or big sister or father in the Lord who would hold me by the hand. And that meant that I was prone to nonsense. And I was prone to falling flat on my face on a steady, consistent basis. But I mean, how can I fall on my face every single day? Yeah? That wouldn't be nice. I don't think it would look good on me. I don't think it would look good on the God that called me either. But I didn't know what to do. So there was one day and I was just, I was really agonizing over this thing. And I think I believe that it was the Holy Spirit. And he said to me, enter a covenant with me. So I started to pay attention. And essentially it culminated in a covenant that I have with God up till the last day of my life. And that covenant is, Lord, I may not always make the right decision. But before the decision that I make will have me and grind me to a halt. Lord, you grind the thing to a halt. Now this prayer point is just me, or this covenant that I had entered with God is me giving God full permission. He doesn't even need to discuss it with me to frustrate anything that I put my hand on that is not him. And I've seen it happen time and time and time again. What this means is that I've lost money in the process. What this means is that, because, I mean, when you are not supposed to employ someone, you employ, I've had bad employ, bad, I've made bad employ, employment that lasted three years. Every single month in those three years, I paid a salary that I knew God did not ask me to pay. But it was now my cross, I was carrying it, and then eventually one day, I will finally have a release and a courage to take my, the burden or the yoke off of my neck. But I have, I mean, I've had someone work for me. Imagine someone working for you for three years and you knew that was not a good hire. But then you went back to God and said, Lord, I made a mistake. What should I do? He said, no, that cross, you will carry it first. So I've lost money in the process. I, but the thing is with each experience I learn, with each experience I learn. So I've given you two ways to deal with this quickly. Number one, a daily prayer, Lord, let my heart always be aligned with your will so that I will not do anything that you haven't asked me to do. Number two, Lord, I give you permission. Anything I put my hands to, 
that it doesn't matter how much it looks like you if it is not you lord knock it over let it scatter Lord, whether it's a man trying to marry me, I'm married already, so I'm just saying if I were single and I was smart, this would have saved me a lot of heartache. Lord, I do not want to have to go on a second date with anyone that is not your will. The moment we start, let something happen on the first date and mess it all up. Of course, you come back home and you feel this, uh, depressed or maybe disappointed again. But better disappointed at your first date than at, in the 10th year of your marriage, yeah? So, this have failed for me, oh, they have worked. I don't, you can add your own. You don't necessarily have to you know, do what I am asking you to, or what I am saying I have done. But what I do know that is this has worked for me. Do you understand this? So, if we move on, they said to Joshua, where are your servants? That's verse number 8. Then Joshua said to them, who are you? Where do you come from? They said to him, your servants have come from a country that is very far away. Because of the fame of your God, for we have heard the news about him and all the remarkable things he did in Egypt. And everything that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan. To Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who live in Ashtaroth. So our elders and all our residents of our country said to us, take provisions to the journey, for the journey. Go and meet with the sons of Israel and say to them, We are your servants. Now make a covenant treaty with us. This bread of ours was hot, fresh when we took it along as our provision from our houses on the day we left to come to you. Now look, it is dry, it has crumbs, it has and has turned to crumbs. These wine skins which we were filled were new. And look, they are split, our clothes and our sanders are worn out because of the very long journey that we had to make. The pro they were showing Joshua proof of the fact that they came from a far away. Now, if you take a if you take a notice, everything that they showed to Joshua, let me list them for you. They had worn out sacks. They had worn out wine skins. They had worn out and patched sandals. They had worn out clothes. They had worn out. Uh, they had dry supply of food. Everything that they showed to the children of Israel, guess where? It was surface. It was sight. Everything they showed to the children of Israel was sight. Do you remember when we talked about Achan? That seeing always begins from the eyes. You see. It, was, it is in seeing that you covet and then you make a, a decision. Remember we talked about desire, deceit, and what? Decision. Desire, deceit, and decision. Even when the devil comes to trick you or yes, or to deceive you, that's how he comes. He plays to sight. So they showed Joshua all these things and Joshua bought it and his men bought it hook, line and sinker. Now, despite the hunch they had, which I believe was the kick of the Holy Spirit saying, don't do this. Lord, do, uh, um, do not do this, Joshua. Men of Israel, do not do this. Probe further. Ask small questions. They didn't ask. Now, if you have read your Bible, you also know that the Holy Spirit is a gentle spirit. He doesn't scream. He will say to you, if you don't believe him or if you don't follow his promptings and his proddings, there are two ways to always learn. You can learn by instruction. Or you can learn by experience. None of it will kill you. The choice is yours. I guess the Holy Spirit took the back seat at that point and said, I've done my best. So let's just wait and see how this is going to end up. They had the prodding. They actually said directly to the men, perhaps you are from our land. Joshua asked them pointedly, who are you? Where do you come from? And they started this long story. The question was so short. The answer was so long that in my own natural inclination, if I ask you a short question and your answer is very long and your answer is tending into defensive mode, I always am suspicious. Sorry, that's me. But none of that happened with these guys. They saw the one out sacks. They saw the, saw the one out wineskins. They saw the one out and patched sandals. The one out clothes. The dry supply of food. And guess what they said? They said, okay. In verse 14, the Bible says, So the men of Israel 
took some of their own provisions and offered them in friendship. I want to read this particular verse in many different um, versions of the Bible. Verse number 14. In the King James Version, it says, The men took their victuals. They received the men by reason of their victuals. They asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. That is, they saw the things that the men presented and they received them based on the things that they saw. These are the people that God speaks to mouth to mouth. In the Amplified Version, it says, So the men of Israel took some of their provision and offered them in friendship and foolishly did not ask the counsel of the Lord. In the message version, it says, the men of Israel looked them over and accepted the evidence, but they didn't ask God about it. All versions agree that they walked by sight. All versions agreed that they left the most important thing behind, asking God what he thought. What's the point of going on a journey with the king of kings if you will not deploy his capacity? To know the end from the beginning. You are limited in your capacity. In your next, you are extremely limited. I was telling my sister Audrey this afternoon on, when we were talking. I said, no prophet foresaw COVID. That is how God can conceal a matter if he wants it concealed. So no, we don't sit here and think we know all things. But you see, in not knowing all things, you have a God who knows every single thing. The Bible says he knows the end of a thing from the beginning. And he has made himself available to you. Listen to me very carefully. Why would you make mistakes when you have the God of heaven? Why would you do that? When I met, first met my husband, he had a habit that frustrated the living daylights out of me. But today, 23 years later, I'm grateful to God that he never changed that particular um, trait that he had. It didn't matter whether you were screaming that the house was on fire. Mark would say to you, let me think about it. Oh my God, he used to frustrate me. I'm like, think guy, that is why you have a brain. Think. What is there to think about? We can think it now. But there was nothing, there is nothing you will say to Mark that will make him budge. He will say to me, I need to think about it. And I used to think, where is this man from? Why is he thinking about everything? Why can't we just make a decision? Both of us are educated. We are supposed to be two good heads. So how can't we just come together and solve this small problem? Why are we having to sleep on everything? I used to like shake. I'd be like, ah, oh boy, no, no, this one. He had many 3 a.m. conversations and he didn't like them. Because as long as I haven't landed the conversation, I cannot sleep, yeah? So he, he, he can sleep on his feet. So when he's sleeping at three, I wake him up. And that's me trying to get him to do what I want to do without letting him finish his thinking about it. He would listen to you. If he would manage to stay awake with you. But he would still say to you, I need time to think about it. But as time went on, I started to see that my husband apologized less because he wasn't presumptuous. He took his time to make his decisions. And the moment he made his decision, he had this knack and stubbornness not to shift from them. He would just stand by there and I'm like, what is this one now? We make decisions. They don't work. We move away from them. What is this one that we must hold something like this? But as I grew, and thankfully, he kept it on, I started to learn from him that to say to someone, give me time to think about it, saves you a lot of aggro, saves you a lot of stress, saves you a lot of stress. So I started to learn it too. So someone will talk to me. I'll have the answer at the tip of my tongue these days. And I'll say, can I think about it? That's me practicing what I have been learning for 23 years. I haven't mastered it. But I'm learning, I promise you. Let me think about it. It's become a conversation that we both have with each other and with people around us. So what I find when you take time to think that like Joshua and his men ought to have done, or what I find when you ask someone, let me th think about it. You don't necessarily have to say to them, let me go pray about it. 
because people take offense when you say you want to pray about things. Not that it bothers me, but um, I think that when you say, let me think about it, and, it, and you go back and you pray about it, it's even better. So what I found was that in doing that, I was able to make better quality decisions. And I continue to be able to make better quality decisions over time. So that's what they should have done. But the Bible said they looked at the evidence that was offered. And based on the evidence, they did not ask counsel of the Lord. Again, what is the point of having God preserve you post-COVID and all of this? Only for you to run around again and make decisions like you are your own boss. If you are your own boss, why didn't I see you on the street today without mask and just hugging everybody? You are not your own boss. If you were preserved, you have been hid and you have been kept for such a time as this for something. So you must yield to the counsel of God. Otherwise, well, if I say it now, people say I'm cursing you, so let me just go on. So they didn't do that. The Bible says in verse number 15, Joshua made peace with them. And made a covenant treaty with them to let them leave. And the leaders of the congregation of Israel swore an oath with them. You will say it's no big deal, right? Verse 16, three days later, they found out that these guys were just three days journey away from them. You will not believe it. They were just three days journey away from them. What can you do after that? You have already entered a covenant. Now, God was very particular about a covenant. If you read Psalms 15, Psalms 15, verse number 4, it says, if you swore an oath, even to your heart, you should keep it. That is, you don't say, eh, I was drunk when I made the oath. You don't say, I was too excited when I, when I pledged that thing. I'm sorry, I can't do it again. The Lord says a man of integrity does not change his mind simply because it is inconvenient. But beyond that is the fact that if you go with me, and I want us to go there, I want to read something to you. If you go with me to Exodus 23, because this is not just a situation of um, Joshua, and okay, they will not now have the land of Hivites. It's bigger than that. In Exodus 23 from verse 31, I'm reading the Amplified Version. It says, I will establish your borders from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines, the Mediterranean, and from the wilderness to the river Euphrates. For I will hand over the residents of the land to you, and you shall drive them out before you. Verse 32, you shall not make a covenant with them or with their gods. They shall not live in your land because they will make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it is certain to be a trap for you, resulting in judgment. If there was anything that caused the great, what you call, quote and unquote, the great fall of the man Solomon, it was foreign gods, foreign wives, and foreign gods. God already, because he knows the end of a thing from the beginning, he's telling us now, watch your alliances in the new. Watch who you do business with in the new. Watch who you get in partnerships with in the new. Do not allow what you will eat or momentary gain make you tie yourself or lock yourself in, in with people that I have here marked for destruction if possible. Be careful. Don't just jump into stuff. Do not just jump into stuff. In Exodus 23, the Lord was clear. And someone will say to me, but Joshua didn't know about it. No, you lie. Joshua knew about it because at this point, Joshua was already serving Moses. Joshua was there when this was said. So Joshua knew that it was an abomination in the sight of God for the people of God to enter into covenant with the people of the land that the Lord had given them. But here was Joshua not doing the, just the simple task. And the thing about Joshua is that Joshua didn't need to fast for two days for God to speak to him. 
The moment he went to God, God opened. It looked like God was ever always excited to talk to Joshua. And it's not different from you and me. God wants to speak to us daily, consistently. If you ask him, he will give you the answer. Whether he gives it to you by someone else or by scripture, the Lord will always answer his own. He doesn't gain anything in keeping us in the dark. He knows if we're in the dark, we'll make mistakes. God doesn't enjoy mistakes from us. So he's consistently speaking and telling. He told them ages ago, before they even ever knew Moses would die. Before Joshua knew he would lead the children of Israel, God had already told them, when you get into that land, do not make a covenant with them or their gods. If there was any need for the children of Israel to be careful, this was one of such needs. They ought to be extremely careful. But look at your verse 16 again. Verse 15 again. Joshua entered in, made peace with them and entered into a covenant treaty with them. In verse 16, it was revealed. Joshua accosts them, or how's the word, confronts them and says to them, why did you do this? And they say, well, we have heard that your God certainly is not going to spare anybody and we didn't want to die. So we decided that it was better to be slaves than to be dead. It was too late because the children of Israel had entered a covenant. <laughs> If you not pay attention to this warning you are getting today and you enter a covenant in the future, I promise you, you will not be able to get out of it. You will not be able to get out of it. Don't care who the deliverance minister is, who has prays for you and says he has broken the covenant. Jump where? It's not, that's not the way it's going to work. Because you had express instruction. The Lord is preparing us for our new why can't you pray the right people into your life? Why can't you pray the right kinds of businesses? Why can't you pray the right jobs? Why would you not ask God? It's not that hard. I've reached a stage in my life that honestly is better for me to be without than to take anything that God did not give me. I don't feel judge matter. I'm, I'm, I think I'm too old for that nonsense now. I don't want to be judging what I don't know. So what is the way forward for me personally? I will just be humble. I come every day and say, Lord, this small child has come again. She doesn't know anything. Dollar like her, help her. I don't have it. I have no qualms to be nothing before God. Absolutely no qualms. If I hear his counsel and I go out, I'll be taller than everybody in my spirit. That's the way I see it. I will take counsel. So Joshua called the Hivite men in verse 22 and said, why have you done this thing? And of course they said, oh, well, you see, this is the reason we know that it is better to be your servant than we die. Da, 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 da. Verse 25, it says, now look, we are, now, they said to him, now look, we are in your hands. Do to us as it seems good and right in your sight. And in verse 26, so it was that he did to them. He rescued them from the hands of the Israelites and they did not kill them. Now on that day, Joshua made them cutters of, and gatherers of wood, firewood and water carriers for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord to this day in the place he would choose. So they became servants. But these people were happy to be servants. They, they, they figured it was better to be a servant than to die. But there's something I skipped because I wanted to come back to it. And that is found in verse number, let me look for it. In verse number 17, Then the sons of Israel set out and came to their cities on the third day. Now the cities of the Hevites were Gibeon and Chipera and Berot and Kiriah-Jerim. But the sons of Israel did not strike them because the, el the leaders of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, to spare them. And all the congregation murmured, expressing great dissatisfaction against the leaders. Verse 19, But all the leaders said to the whole congregation, We have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, so we cannot touch them. You will think that they will say it was a mistake. They got us by deceit. And because they got us by deceit, we can break that covenant anyhow. You need to understand that some things are bigger than some things. 
In this case, their covenant with God made more sense than any other thing. God had warned them, but they had gone and entered covenant. And in Psalm 15, God was very clear. He said, the one that can ascend into the heel of the Almighty is the one that does not put his hand to many things. And then in verse number four, the B part, he says, the one that will swear to his heart, and keep it. That meant that if you made a promise, even if it's breaking your back, you have to follow through because you made that promise. You've given your word. A man of integrity does not take his word back. And I'm saying that, look, you can either do your new in the easy way or we can do it in the hard way. I want to do it the easy way. If you don't, in case you don't know, I'm what the Yorubas call an ole. I'm lazy bones. If God can do it, I don't want to do it. That's my and so I, I, it's easier for me to just follow his instruction. I don't want to do rough or rough with God at all. So you can either choose not to do rough or rough with him and just obey his instructions, or you can choose to disobey, enter the treaties you want to enter, but remember that this time you will not, nobody will be breaking it for you. You will follow through because you made a decision if you make a decision then it behoves on you to follow through with it i've been speaking without looking at my notes i'll go through my notes because i want to quickly round off now what is it that i can learn from joshua chapter 9 i saw leaders who stood by their word and I'm asking God that he will make me a leader who can stand by her word. Make me that person. Whether I give my word to my children, I'll give my word to my husband, I'll give my word to my, the people who work with me, whoever I give my word to, oh God, may I be bold enough to follow through on the word that I give. May I not be that one who would blame someone or something or a circumstance to take my word back. Let it be said that because I made a promise, I follow through, even though they could see that I was breaking my back. But beyond that, I want the best from you, O oh God. And so I am asking today that you will give me the capacity to always come to you first before I reach any decision, because then it will save me a lot of aggro. If you will help me, O oh Lord, I am willing. Some of the lessons I've learned today from this is that number one pay attention and give the holy spirit priority of place in your life don't make the holy spirit an afterthought he's god's gift to you he's god's gift of discernment the moment you have the holy spirit and you are parleying with him and you are paying attention this is what is going to happen you will not make expensive mistakes do you understand that you will not make expensive mistakes. And now he's asking what is rough or rough for. Oh, I mean, I don't get, don't worry. Okay, trans, translators are there too. That's good. You will not make expensive mistakes if you pay attention, you give the Holy Spirit priority. Don't make him an afterthought. That's number one. Number two, ask for discernment on a daily basis. Say, Lord, I'm off again today to pursue my hustle. I ask, oh God, that according to your word that says that the paths of the righteous has a shining light, shine it brighter and brighter unto a perfect day. That's what I want. But I'm also praying today that because the Bible says you lead the righteous, that the parts of, that you are led by God, that the steps of, of the righteous are led by you. Father, order my steps today. May I not go where you did not prepare for me. That is, ask for discernment on a daily basis. You want to be that person that people are talking to you, even in a boardroom, and you're praying on, under your breath and asking the Holy Spirit to interpret their English to you because these days people say one thing and they mean 55 other things. Tell the Holy Spirit, paint me pictures. I am relying on you on this meeting, oh, at this meeting, oh God. May I not speak words that don't make sense. If I speak, let thy words be clear. As they are talking to me, Lord, I need an interpreter in the Holy Ghost. Let him interpret to me. Someone is saying, can I tax the Lord like that? So why do you have him if you cannot press into him for such things? 
The third thing that I learned from Joshua chapter 9 is pay attention to the slightest unrest in your spirit. Do not discount it and say, it's because, maybe it's because I drank too much ogi before I left the house. Don't say, it's maybe it's because I, what I ate to sleep was pepper soup and I had hard bun. And a settlement or unrest in your spirit is different from all of these things. It's not, it's not a heartburn. It's not a constipation. You need to know when the Holy Spirit is making, making you feel like the place is now too tight for you. Pay attention to the wangle of the Holy Spirit. The fourth thing that I've learned and I'm passing on to you is seek counsel from trusted voices if need be. There are some things you would have heard and then you want to. There must be at least, you know I've told us this thing before, there, has, there must be at least one person, one voice you trust to be able to speak the voice of God over you. I know that it's better to hear God for yourself and I have been saying that a lot. But sometimes for comfort, you need further confirmation. May you have, may the Lord surround you with those kinds of relationships where people would not have anything to gain in, turn, in not telling you the truth. The fifth thing that I want to commend to your attention today is don't rush your decisions. When you are unsure, pray. Tell them I'm coming and pray. If they call you the next day, say I'm praying. There was a young lady that asked me to write a forward to her book about three, four weeks ago. Actually, more than that. Because I kept her for one month. Because I wasn't hearing anything from God. And I'm done with doing good deeds. I wasn't going to do good deeds. That is me putting my name on paper for someone for all of time. So I said to her, um, I've heard you. I need to talk to God about this. But if you're in a hurry, then you can pass. I will pass. It's okay. So she said something. That was the first sign of a relief that I got. She said, I will wait however long it takes. And she never bothered me once until I got a release from God to write that forward. You want to be that person that can wait on God. What's the worst that can happen? The first boss and the second boss and the third boss and the fourth boss will leave you behind. It's better to get a query for coming late one day than not making it to the office, if you know what I mean. So don't rush your decisions. The sixth thing I want to commend to you is when you, make your, when you make mistakes, own up to them and do the best you can with them. This is not the, the season to pass the buck. This is not the season to point fingers at everyone else but you. This is not the season when everyone else is making the bad decisions and you are the one that just came around, al along for the ride. No, that's not you. If you did not listen to the first five things I said by the Holy Spirit this evening and you still made a bad decision. Own it. Chest out. Be a man or a woman, whatever. Shut chest out and carry your load. Daddy Shoki said it. Eleru. Carry your load by yourself. This is not the time to shunt the responsibilities. Sometimes we make those decisions that we ought not to make so that the Lord can train us in another dimension. So I promise you it will not all be all bad. It will just be that the journey that you should have taken seven days will take you 40 years. But it's okay because God will make sure your clothes don't wear off in 40 years. Your sandals are the same in 40 years. You quack myself, you don't grow old in 40 years. Isn't that great? Gracious. He, that was what he did for the children of Israel. So he can do it for you again. Is it his best? No. This is called the permissive will of God. I want to walk in the purposeful will of God. But Lord, should I miss your purposeful will? May I be the best person I can be in your permissive will? That's the conversation we are having now. The seventh thing I want to commend to you is important isn't necessarily urgent. I want to say it again and I want to say it slowly. Important isn't necessarily urgent. That something is urgent does not mean that it is important. And that something is important does not mean it carries an urgency. Know the difference. Important isn't necessarily urgent. I have learned this, especially in running a business. Have you seen your staff show up and say, man, we have to make the payment now. Man, we have to go now. I'll just be looking at them like, oh. 
No, I'm not. I actually would just say to them, in fact, the more agitated you are for us to do it now, the more calm I am. I'm saying to you, no, I'm not doing it. Because I don't know. There's no roof on fire. I don't know why you are pushing me like this. Every time that happens, we save ourselves money. Every single time that I'm able to just not let them pressure me to making that decision. When you come back, you find out that something was wrong with the arrangement. Not necessarily because they are bad people and they want to fleece you out, but they haven't done their calculations properly. They haven't, there's something that always goes amiss. So important isn't necessarily urgent. Just because someone, it is urgent for you, does not mean that it is urgent for me. In the scheme of the things that God has told me, if I wake up every morning as Sister B, you ought to know that God has given me an agenda for the day. So if you, try, if you send me a message at 9, PM, 9 a.m. and say, can I call you? And I say, no, I would be available at 3 p.m. It's not the time to go off in a half because you are not the boss of me. God is giving me an outline and I'm following his outline. When he gets to your turn, I will get to you. And I promise you, nothing will kill you before that time. Important isn't necessarily urgent. If it's, if, in fact, once they are waving all kinds of flags in the air, just shut it down. Say, I'll go sleep first. I, I'll come back tomorrow. Because when you come back tomorrow, the first thing you will realize is that God will give you fresh eyes. And when you show up there, you will see things that you're not supposed to see. Have you ever done a document and you are feeling like you want to send it? Your teammates are saying, let's send it, let's send it. But you've checked it. They said you can send it before 12 noon tomorrow. And you said to them, okay, I will deal with it. And you shut up your computer and you went home. And you came back the next day when you opened it. Everything is gibberish. Have you ever seen that? And it will save you a whole ton of mess in the end. Just because you took that extra three, four hours, took your, yourself off the pressure and came back to it. And because of that, you were able to get it done properly. Important isn't necessarily urgent. Take 24 hours. Take a week if you need to. This is not stalling. This is wanting to do the will of God. They are different. Finally, I want you to open with me as I'm rounding up. I want you to open with me to the book of 2 Samuel. Because you, if you don't know your Bible yet, you will think that, well, at least God did not kill them in the process. God still forgave Joshua. So it's not that bad. Mm. Yes, Joshua didn't get to suffer it. But if you go with me to 2 Samuel chapter 10 from verse 1 to 14, there's a story there that breaks my heart every time I see it. It's the story of David. David was now the king and he had been ruling. And then one day, for three consecutive years in the land of Israel, there was a famine. Three consecutive years. 2 Samuel 21, verse 1 to 14. For three years, there was a famine. It wasn't easing up. It was just ongoing. Three years. People were dying. Nothing was happening. So David went and sought the face of the Lord. He went to God and said, Lord, I know that uh, the last time that this thing happened, I was the one that caused it. I took a census. What did I do this time? And God said, no, this has nothing to do with you. Then who? The Lord said, this is a because of the sons of the Gibeonites <laughs> that saw put to death. Eh? So Joshua entered a covenant with them in Joshua chapter 9. That we will not kill you. You will just be our woodcutters and water fetchers all your life. So they remained in the land. And in second somewhere, even check your Bible, how many books later? In second somewhere 21, a famine broke out. What was the issue? Saul, even the Saul that killed the sons of the Gibeonites had died. But Saul had, the Bible said it was because of his overzealousness, put to death some of the sons of the Gibeonites. <laughs> so because of that, the uh, curse that came with, the, um, with breaking the covenant was activated and there was a famine in the land. So David asked God, okay, what do you want me to do about it? 
And God told David, he said, go and ask the Gibeonites what they want. <laughs> so David said to the Gibeonites, what should I do for you? How can I make it good so that you will bless the Lord's inheritance? Can you imagine? Because Joshua brought them in. Israel was now at their mercy. They had to speak a word for the famine over Israel to stop. So the Gibeonites said to Saul, to David in verse number 4, said, we will not accept silver. We will not accept gold. Anything. We don't want anything. What we want are the heads of seven sons of Saul. And they took five sons of one woman called Micah. And they took two other sons. Seven sons of Saul. That is descendants of Saul, not his Saul, not his direct sons. And they had to slaughter them and hang them up before the plague ceased. The question you will ask is, why would God let that happen? Because they made a covenant and someone broke it. The thing is, Joshua that entered the covenant without inquiring of the Lord had died. Many, many other leaders had come and gone in that time. But that thing was still hovering. And one day, one man who refused to check history made a decision and executed his decision. And trouble started. Now, the thing I want you to see is that the only person out of the sons of Saul that was spared was the young man, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan. And the only reason why Mephibosheth made it out of that thing was because there was a covenant over Mephibosheth's life that was higher than the covenant that the Kibionites had with Israel. You know, I talked to us maybe three classes ago about covenants. I did tell us about covenants. That a believer who has no covenant is a joke. If you remember, I said so. If you are a believer, you can't stand and say, here are my covenants with God. You, you are joking. Because the devil just has been playing with you. The day he will show up, you will know you are joking. A believer who has no covenant is a joke. The only reason Mephibosheth made it out of this wahala was that Mephibosheth had another covenant. And the covenant was between Jonathan, his late father, and David the king. David had sworn an oath with Jonathan that he would do Jonathan's sons good. So when David had to look for the heads of seven sons of, of Saul, of course Mephibosheth was not going to be making the number. My brothers and my sisters, I can go on and on. Like I told you when we started, this is one loaded chapter. But I'm sure you can see why your nest cannot be haphazard. You can see why your nest cannot just be anything you think you want, you want it to be. You can see why your nest cannot be built on presumption. You can see why your nest cannot be something that you are sloppy and slothful about. The season we are entering into is a season where your fire needs to burn. You need to be that person who knows his God. He is strong and he's able to do exploits. Watch your alliances. Always ask God, Lord, what do you want us to do? Otherwise, man, me. But I know our God is merciful. That's why we're even studying this right now. He's preparing us. And if this once you've heard it is not enough, I'm sure by tomorrow it will be on YouTube. It is already on my app. You can go there on my app. You can download it. You can replay it. Just replay it over and over and over and over. What I expect those who have been following the study of Joshua to have is that they ought to have a strategy and a template when the study is over for their nest. Who knows how, much, how many more days of lockdown we have. But I'm pretty sure that before the, we are truly, truly free to move around the way life we used to move around, we would have finished the study. Will you pay attention to the things that God is speaking? Or will you say that woman, she doesn't have anything to do. She's just teaching every day. No, I have plenty to do. I like Netflix and I can sleep. Those two things. They walk. Even if I can't sleep, I can watch Netflix. I promise you, I can binge for three days on end. And I won't feel guilty at all. 
But this, the Lord told me to do it. I hope you're paying attention. We've come to the end of our class and I need you to pray. I've been seeing some powerful prayer points raised already. And I want you to pray. Whatever prayer point you have distilled out of today's teaching, you pray for yourself. Pray for yourself. Speak to God about it. This is not the time for us to be sloppy. This is not the time not to watch your boundaries. This is not the time to just do, do things before you think about them. This is not the time to pretend that you know when you don't know. This is not the time that you fake it until you make it. This is not that time. This is the time that when you show up, you must have a plan. And that plan better be from heaven. So pray for yourself as we round up. Our Father and our God, we honor your name. Thank you for this time, O oh God, in your presence. Thank you for the words that you've spoken to our spirit today. Lord, I've said a lot of things. Peradventure, there is any amongst this that isn't your will. Father, expunge it from the memory of your children. Let only your truth, O oh God, be what they hear in this time. In the name of Jesus, Lord, let this work for them. Build templates for them. Let their nest, O oh God, because you said the glory of the latter will be greater than the former. Let their nest, O oh God, be better than their previous in the name of Jesus. Father, as they pay attention to your word, give them your counsel, O oh God. Unstop their ears. Unclog them, O oh God. Let them hear you for themselves. Let them know you, O oh God. And Lord, as they do your will, let your name be glorified. Father, I honor and I worship you. May this word not stand against any one of us, O oh God. In the name of Jesus, my King and my glory, thank you. I honor your name and I give you praise. Thank you, God of heaven. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen and amen. Thank you, everyone, for joining this prayer call. This, uh, this, I keep calling it prayer call, right? The study of the book of Joshua chapter 9 this, um, this evening. On Saturday morning at 9 a.m., we will look at Joshua chapter 10. Who knows what we will find when we poke through the pages of that chapter. Thank you so much. May the Lord bless you. May he be kind to you. May he be gracious to you. May he bring you to great peace. And may the light of his countenance consistently rise and shine upon you and yours. In Jesus' name, thank you so much and have a good night. Bye-bye.